Hello, in this session today, we'll be discussing about linguistic anthropology. Linguistic anthropology is one of the branches of anthropology. This branch has three paradigms. The first paradigm was associated with the discipline of linguistics. As linguistics developed its different fields, a new field of linguistic emerged as anthropological linguistics. The field was devoted to linguistic documentation of languages, then seen as doomed to extinction. Major areas of interest for this field include, firstly, grammatical description, secondly, typological classification, and thirdly, the unresolved issue of linguistic relativity. This linguistic relativity was associated with Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Wolf. But it was actually brought to American linguistics by Franz Boas, working within a theoretical framework. One of the postulates in this field is what is called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The argument that language defines the way a person behaves and thinks was made by Edward Sapir. He believed that language and the thoughts that we have are somehow interwoven and that all people are equally affected by the confines of their language. In short, he made all people out to be mental prisoners, unable to think freely because of the restrictions of their vocabularies. Sapir had a student, Benjamin Worf, who picked up on the idea of linguistic determinism. He supported linguistic relativity which states that the differences in language reflect the different views of different people. Wolf coined what was once called the Sapir-Wolf hypothesis which is properly referred to as the Wolf hypothesis. This states that Language is not simply a way of voicing ideas, but is the very thing which shapes those ideas. One cannot think outside the confines of their language. The result of this process is many different worldviews by speakers of different languages. They settled in the mountains where they created a subsistence economy where they did pretty well in rough terrain but were able to um, The second paradigm was launched by Delheims. He fixed the name linguistic anthropology in the 1960s. He also coined the term ethnography of speaking or ethnography of communication to describe the agenda he envisioned for the field. It would involve taking advantage of new developments in technology such as Mechanical Recording A new unit of analysis was also introduced by Heinz. Whereas the first paradigm 
focus on ostensibly distinct languages, the second paradigm uses the unit of analysis as the speech event. The speech event is an event defined by the speech occurring in it. A lecture, for example, is a speech event. In a speech situation, a speech may or may not occur. Much attention was devoted to speech events in which performers were held accountable for the form of their linguistic performance as such. Since the late 1980s, linguistic anthropology does not take much interest in continuing to pursue agendas that come from a discipline alien to anthropology. Linguistic anthropologists have systematically addressed themselves to problems posed by the larger discipline of anthropology, but using linguistic data and methods. Main areas of study thus become identity, socialization, social spaces, ideology, etc. Now, the linguistic anthropology can be defined as a study of language, as a cultural resource, and speaking as a cultural practice. The speakers are considered as social actors, members of a particular complex communities, each organized in a variety of social institutions and through a network of intersecting but not necessarily overlapping sets of expectations, beliefs and moral values about the world. It is an interdisciplinary field. It relies on and expands existing methods in other disciplines linguistics and anthropology in particular. It aims to understand the multifarious aspects of language as a set of cultural practices. It is not just a study of language done by anthropologists. The act of providing a written account of some aspects of the grammar of language spoken by people without writing does not come within the ambit of linguistic anthropology. The scope of linguistic anthropology is different from a linguistic study or survey as well as from ethnographic account of a particular ethnic group. The focus of linguistic anthropology is on languages as a symbolic resource that enters the constitution of social fabric and the individual representation of actual or possible worlds. Such a focus allows linguistic anthropologists to address in innovative ways some of the issues and topics that are at the core of anthropological research such as the politics of representation, the constitution of authority, the legitimation of power, the cultural basis of ethnicity and racism and many more. The basic assumption of linguistic anthropology is that there are dimensions of speaking that can only be captured 
by studying what people actually do with language, by matching words, silence and gesture with the context in which these signs are produced. And, uh, for example, <clears throat> the decor that you will find today, uh, we couldn't do, for example, the chairs, the frigidaire. There are three major theoretical areas within linguistic anthropology. And let us see what are those areas. Three major theoretical areas within linguistic anthropology are there and these are developed recently and they are related with performance, indexicality and participation. The concept of performance has a number of sources and a number of ways of interpretation. One dimension of performance is originated from Noam Chomsky in his distinction between competence and performance. Competence is a knowledge of the language that the ideal speaker has. On the other hand, performance is the application of that knowledge in the acts of speaking. The second meaning of performance is related with the works of Jail Austin. Performance is considered as doing of things with words. All utterances do something. Yet another dimension of performance is derived from folklore studies, poetics, more generally from arts. Performance is something creative, realize, achieve. It is a dimension of human life that is most typically emphasized in music. Theater. and other public displays of artistic abilities and creativity. It is found in verbal debates but will not yield to the onslaught of the commercialization mm -hmm. with which there is a powerful storytelling <laughs> singing and other speech activities. Performance has yet another dimension that implies a notion of creativity and improvisation. This is found across all kinds of speech activities and speech events. Communication is not only the use of symbols that stands for beliefs. Feelings. Identities. Events, etc. It is also a way of pointing to, presupposing or bringing into the present context beliefs, feelings, identities, events. This is what is sometimes called the indexical meaning of signs. Indices are signs that have some kind of existential relation with what they refer to. This category can be easily extended to linguistic expressions like the demonstrative pronouns such as this, that, those, etc. Personal pronouns like I and you. Temporal expressions like 
now, then, yesterday. Special expression like up, down, below and above etc. In this type of meaning, a word does not stand for an object or concept. It rather points to or connects to something in the context. The property of these expressions is called indexicality. The indexes range from apparently innocuous inquiries like can you speak French to political commitment like which site are you on? In participation, the speakers are considered as social actors and the speaking as social activity. The speaker is a member of a speech community. A competent speaker means one who is able to do things with that language as a part of larger social activities that are culturally organized and must be culturally interpreted. The notion of participation stresses the inherently social, collective and distributed quality of any act of speaking. It assumes cognition to manage the retrieval of information and the prediction of others' action necessary for problem solving. It also assumes a corporeal component, a life body that interacts with the environment not only physically but also meaningfully. Alessandro Duranti of California University explains that the uniqueness about linguistic anthropology lies in its interests and speakers as social actors in language as both a resource for and a product of social interaction in speech communities as simultaneously real and imaginary entities whose boundaries are constantly being reshaped and negotiated through myriad acts of speaking. After looking at the major theoretical areas of linguistic anthropology, we can somehow conclude that among the other linguistic sciences, linguistic anthropology is the closest to social linguistics. Linguistic anthropologists share an interest in speakers as members of speech communities and the social distribution of linguistic forms, repertoires and speech activities.